hello friends so uh hello i welcome you all uh here i have come up with the discussion of the anesthesia questions that came in neat pg 2022 as you all know it was a uh expected kind of a paper the trend these days that we are seeing is that we are getting more of conceptual questions uh rather than purely fact based questions and if you analyze your uh scores or if you go back and see how many questions came and at the outset you would feel that it is a, a very very difficult paper but sooner as you keep on digging you will realize everything came from what you have read it's just that they are not going to give you the exact lines from your notes or your textbooks they are always going to make it pretty clinical and so that you don't have to uh mug up things and you have to actually understand the concept behind a thing and then only answer right so i am here to discuss the anesthesia questions and uh, as i always tell you that anesthesia questions are pretty straightforward so we got four questions in anesthesia out of which three are directly from the dvt that i took last year you can always go back and check the dvt it's a very concise format and i tried to give you the most high yield things and from that one hour 10 minute discussion we got three questions and a question that came is usually something that is taught to you uh, a lot in pathology and surgery per se i don't cover it but it is something that uh, comes up with a lot of discussion in uh, liver transplant cases and in pathology in uh, coagulation analysis and factors of coagulation right so let's discuss these four questions first question it is something that whenever i teach i always keep telling that i don't know why but the examiners are obsessed with ulnar nerve in anesthesia and we have seen this particular question asked in different ways three times in the last four years which is a pretty uh, surprising thing but then again something that we already knew and insisted so again they gave a question and they gave an image which i usually use in the class itself where they have attached a neuromuscular monitor this is the neuromuscular monitor this is peripheral nerve stimulator which is attached to the ulnar nerve and the muscle that we are monitoring is adductor pollicis muscle and they have asked that neuromuscular monitoring is most commonly done with which nerve options were very pretty straightforward ulnar radial median optic nerve the first option ulnar nerve is the correct answer uh, i'm sorry it is nerve not never okay a uh, little bit about neuromuscular monitoring why do we use neuromuscular monitoring to assess the quality of intubation so we know that there are three phases in anesthesia one is the induction phase another is the maintenance phase and third is the post extubation phase or the post operative phase right so we need neuromuscular monitoring at all three places at induction to see the quality of intubation that means how much vocal cord is relaxed during the surgery maintenance to assess the depth of the block and at extubation to see whether there is any residual neuromuscular block or not so that you can safely extubate the patient so at every stage of anesthesia there is a requirement of neuromuscular monitoring we use the principle of peripheral nerve stimulation where simply we take a peripheral motor nerve we stimulate it electrically and then we record the response of the nerve now most of the time the questions that we get is on the technical aspects of neuromuscular monitoring which are three things first is the most common nerve and muscle combination used which i keep on insisting ulnar nerve is most common adductor pollicis is the most common muscle second most common used is facial nerve and orbicularis oculi muscle so the first is to choose the nerve and muscle combination second is to record the response of this muscle so there are different technologies to record the response of the muscle electromyography emg mechanomyography mmg acceleromyography amg out of this mechanomyography is considered to be gold standard while acceleromyography is considered to be most commonly used this is also something that you have to remember very very important for your exams lastly patterns of stimulations and there are four patterns of stimulation we don't read double burst stimulation it is beyond the scope of our understanding these are the three patterns which we learn read and understand out of which train of four is most commonly used pattern again something that comes up very often most commonly used pattern so this is the basic about neuromuscular mon monitoring and a question that keeps repeating from this topic is which is the most common nerve muscle combination used for neuromuscular monitoring so there goes the first question second is again a very very expected question it's a very important part of the cpr that i always teach that is a man was eating at a restaurant suddenly starts choking what would be your next step perform perform blind finger sweep now this has been 
abandoned since last 15 years you do not perform blind finger sweep there are multiple reasons for that that foreign body can go in and cause complete obstruction the foreign body the patient can bite your uh, finger it is not always advisable to do anything so blindly you don't know what is happening with the patient heimlich maneuver cpr chest compression and back blows so let's first discuss what is this choking scenario so choking as a scenario is discussed in two aspect one is choking in adults and in choking we consider anybody who is more than one year as adult in the sense of the guideline so either more than one year or less than one year old now when there is a less than one year old choking patient then you do alternate chest compression and back blows so you give five chest compression and five back blows alternate chest compression and back blows but in anyone who is more than one year old you first need to see whether it's a complete airway obstruction or partial so these are certain basic things that is preventable cause of death it mostly is because of the food stuck in the mouth uh, what is important is to see this universal choking signs in adults you can see either with one hand or two hand the patient is not able to verbalize no sound coming out of the patient is a very very important part of choking because complete choking complete airway obstruction may you will not see any sound coming out of the patient which is very very important for you okay so universal choking sign now what will happen if there is mild obstruction that means you can listen to something the patient can verbalize something there is breathing but there is also wheezing cuffing important is cuffing then you stay with the person you promote them to cuff you do not give a sub diaphragmatic thrust or heimlich maneuver you call the 911 or activate ERS and get some help but if it is severe obstruction or complete obstruction you see you see universal choking sign weak or no cuff unable to make high pitched uh, noise talk or make a high pitched noise little or no breathing and appear cyanotic then you start doing abdominal thrusts okay so how do you do it so stay behind the person wrap your arms around the waist under the rib cage so here sub diaphragmatic put your fist above person's navel in the middle of the belly and with your other hand hold the first fist and press forcefully into the abdomen upwards like this okay and then you keep doing it till either the foreign body comes out or the patient loses consciousness in all the guidelines remember you only perform anything else if the patient is conscious if the patient is unconscious that means it is cardiac arrest and what do you do in cardiac arrest always cpr so you do something like this you put one uh, fist then you put another fist over it you give sub diaphragmatic thrust but at any point of time if your patient loses consciousness that means the patient has now because of that hypoxia has gone undergone cardiac arrest and then what will you do you will immediately start doing cpr okay third is again a repeat from what came in last inicet that is the uh, november inicet they gave you a very very easy picture of a nrbm mask which is also called as non re breathing mask something that everybody has seen in the images in the photographs in the uh, news item and covid was going on this was a very very important part of the management of a covid patient who required higher concentrations of oxygen and because of this reservoir bag you can give up to 100 percent oxygen to the patient up to theoretically speaking you can give up to 100 percent oxygen to a spontaneously breathing patient right this is nrbm so the option correct answer is nrbm again in oxygen delivery devices i have taught this many times we have low flow devices like nasal prongs we have reservoir system devices like face mask face mask with reservoir bags and we have high flow systems like air entrainment mask and hfnc okay now this is something that you already know these are the different types of masks the flow rates at which you use it and the fio2 that it delivers you can see non rebreathing mask can give 60 to 80 percent that is factual but theoretically you can give up to 100 percent oxygen while you can control everything in high flow nasal cannula high air entrainment mask is a constant delivery device that means the fio2 that you deliver to the patient is not dependent on the patient's respiratory rate that is a constant delivery device rest all are variable delivery device because with the respiratory rate of the patient the uh, this changes the fio2 that is delivered changes this is how an rbm looks like okay last this is the question that has been taught to you multiple times in surgery in pathology i per se do not discuss coagulation but this is something which is very very important point of care testing we call it point of care testing that means 
something that can be done right besides the patient in the theater and it takes less time so the question is blunt trauma abdomen with liver injury so the patient is very bad intraoperative monitoring of coagulation function is best done by the answer is thromboelastography now let's see what is thromboelastography so i have given you the description that there are so many ways in which you can measure the coagulation of the factor the tests include prothrombin time inr aptt platelet count d dimer act whole blood uh, bleeding time but the problem is they all have long turnaround time that means it takes a long time you have to take the sample take it to the lab bring it back takes time so we wanted something that can be done right there by the side of the patient and gives us a whole picture of coagulation these tests gives us give us only a part of coagulation either they are testing the intrinsic system the extrinsic system the platelet or the clotting the bleeding only these things but what we found was there was a very very good technique that was made called as thromboelastography now the name is only telling you thrombo means the blood is coagulating elastography you check the elasticity of the blood by putting a needle inside the blood and you start giving it low shearing force so you keep moving that needle now initially the blood would be less viscous but as it starts to clot it will become more and more and more viscous and therefore the properties will change and you plot that on a graph so this is how a teg machine looks like it's a very small machine but very very expensive you put two samples together so that you remove any uh, bias that can come because of the sampling error and then you record a graphical image of amplitude of the movement of pin as a function of time and then there are certain analytical softwares which quantify these changes and plot it on a graph and every coagulation abnormality will have a different graph depending on the type of graph that you are getting intraoperatively you know which part of the coagulation cascade is getting affected and you can specifically work on that so it's one of the most amazing things that we have intraoperatively that helps us in point of care testing of intra uh, operative uh, hemodynamic right so these were the four questions that came in anesthesia pretty straight forward pretty easy go through them understand what the concept is and similar type of questions are going to come in all the exams that are going to follow so my best wishes to all of you and uh, see you all again bye